So uh, a very quick review of three presentations uh, from this year's ASCO. As we know, ASCO is not known to be a he malignancy meeting, but I think uh, we have uh, three very good uh, presentations and important ones, so I'll try to uh, cover them briefly. I will use the original slides so we have access to the data, but I promise that I won't, it won't be a, a dry presentation like ASCO presentation. I'll try to really use them as a guide to discuss some of the new topics in the field. Uh, as a clinical uh, investigator, I, of course, work with our industry partners uh, for, uh, with all the new drugs in the lymphoma field. Uh, that, that includes uh, some of the uh, um, drugs that we're discussing today as part of these uh, studies that I'm presenting. So the, the three studies that I picked for this presentation are uh, one on Hodgkin lymphoma, a randomized head-to-head uh, -head study comparing pembrolizumab and brentuximab vedotin, which is in patients who are not uh, transplant eligible. Uh, I think that, that was a very important study. Uh, uh, for the second presentation, we have the, the Aspen trial, which was done in Walden's room, but uh, really comparing xenobrutinib, a second-generation BTK inhibitor to ibrutinib. I think the implications of this study is beyond Walden's room, as we will talk. Um, and then lastly, we have uh, a study with a CAR-T trial on follicular lymphoma, the, looking at the results of this study that looked at Axi cell or axi captagen cell in follicular lymphoma, which uh, will, will have uh, uh, implications in clinical practice in the near future, hopefully. So to start, uh, let, let's start with Hodgkin lymphoma. This is Keynote 204, uh, an open-label study comparing pembrolizumab to brentuximab vedotin in relapse refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. This was presented by Dr. Provila and colleagues, and just as a quick background, uh, as we know, stem cell transplant remains to be standard of care in relapsed refractory Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, we, we all know that brentuximab vedotin, which is an antibody drug conjugate targeting CD30 on Hodgkin cells, is also approved for, for uh, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma in the relapse setting, in the post-transplant, and more recently as part of even the induction, and we have a number of studies. Uh, really using this drug in the first first salvage setting. So it's an established drug for, for Hodgkin. Uh, uh, and also pembrolizumab is approved for Hodgkin lymphoma and patients who had more than three lines of therapy, three or more lines of therapy. But there is really no standard of care for patients who are not eligible for autotransplant. And the question we're trying to, uh, or the investigators were trying to ask here is that which, which, which one of these two drugs as, as monotherapy is, is more effective. So if you look at the study design very quickly, patients uh, with relapse disease were included. They could have relapsed after transplant, or if they were not eligible for transplant, they would be eligible for the study. Of course, uh, measurable disease. One point that we need to pay attention to is that the study did include uh, patients who had prior exposure to brentuximab vedotin, but the response had to be uh, they, they had to have a prior response to brentuximab vedotin. So, of course, um, uh, patients with, with brentuximab vedotin failure were not uh, eligible to participate in the study. Uh, there was a stratification for transplant and lines of therapy, and patients received the standard doses of PEMBRO or brentuximab up to 35 cycles with a, a primary endpoint of progression-free survival, including the, the outcomes post-transplant for those who ended up receiving a transplant later. Uh, I think the disposition, uh, the, the points to look at on this slide is that uh, basically the, the number of patients who were still on treatment at the time of data caught, which was uh, around 9% in the PEMBRO arm and only 2% in brentuximab vedotin. I don't think that's surprising. The, the median time from uh, uh, randomization to the data caught up was for about 26 months. Uh, now. In terms of patient characteristics, again, just, just focusing uh, on the highlights here, uh, there was a well-balanced uh, uh, distribution in terms of the prior autotransplant, uh, around 37% on each arm. And also in terms of primary refractory disease and relapse within the first 12 months, the two groups were well-balanced, which is important. 
Please note that 6.5% of patients under brintuximab arm had prior exposure to brintuximab versus 3%, 3.3% in the PEMBRA arm. Uh, again, in terms of uh, patient characteristics, I think it's important to, again, uh, pay attention to the median time on treatment. On the PEMBRA arm, this was around 300 days versus only 146 or 150 days. So kind of a, uh, really half the time uh, patients end up staying on brentuximab and uh, uh, 17 versus 2% of patients uh, uh, completed the two years of treatment on PEMBRO and uh, BV arms, uh, respectively. So this is the primary endpoint. Again, a pro progression-free survival curve uh, at 12 months, the PFS was 50 Four basically versus 36% in favor of pembrolizumab. So the green curve is pembro, red is uh, uh, brentoximab, and if you look at the hazard ratio, it is a significant uh, hazard ratio with a p-value that's significant. And if you look at the median PFS, we have 13.2 versus 8.3 months, again, in favor of pembrolizumab. Looking at the subgroups, the trend seems to be true at most of the subgroups. Uh, in favor of uh, PEMBRO would be in the left side of the line, and uh, in favor of PEV would be in the right side, which we don't see any dots in the, in the right side. And uh, most of the confidence intervals actually don't involve one, meaning that a lot of uh, those uh, 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 changes were significantly in favor of, uh, in, in favor of pembrolizumab. The subgroup uh, uh, data also supports the, the main endpoint here. What was the overall response? 65 versus 54 percent. This was a significant difference. Again, overall response. Uh, the CR rate, 24 percent at, at, on both treatments, but significantly higher progression. I'm sorry, partial response, uh, 41 versus 30 uh, percent. And the last row on this table would be the time to response, which is equal. It's, as we all know, it's difficult to look at time to response in clinical trials. It's, it's limited to the, the, to the time interval of disease assessment on the trial, which is usually around two or three months. So uh, it's hard to say what to make out of it. But uh, clearly in terms of efficacy, both from the PFS and response, uh, it was in the favor of uh, the, the study uh, favored uh, PEMBRO. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on adverse events. I can tell you there was no surprises in terms of the toxicity that we expect from PEMBRO or BV. Here, just for a reference, we have the grade three or five AEs of 40% or 44% at an each arm. Uh, but really looking at the details of the AEs and the type of AEs that we expect from these, Again, this is not surprising. At the top of this uh, figure uh, or graph, you see the, so the, the green uh, uh, and uh, the left left side would be the PEMBRO side effects, and red or right would be the BV. And as you see, hypothyroidism, fever uh, are the top AEs. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at the bottom there for the red part, you have the neuropathy which is known to be the, the side effect for brentuximab uh, Not No surprises here. And uh, a lot of immune-mediated AEs with the PEMBRO treatment, uh, mainly hypothyroidism, 19%, uh, mostly grade one, two, actually all of them grade one, two. They had pneumonitis, uh, 11%, and uh, almost half of them were grade three or four. So that's, of course, significant with any checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So really, in conclusion, Pembro monotherapy was significantly uh, better than uh, BV monotherapy from the efficacy standpoint, which was progression-free survival and overall response, 13.2 versus 8.3 months. Uh, the benefit was seen at, at, at subgroups, and uh, uh, the responses were durable. The safety profile was uh, consistent with what we know about these two drugs. And I think this study has uh, clinical implications. We all have patients who, for, for any reason, may not be eligible for uh, intensive treatment like auto versus or, or even allogeneic transplant. And I think uh, knowing that this drug, uh, in, in practice, we knew that this would be a very uh, reasonable option for kind of uh, treatment. Um, 
as a, as a treatment option for those patients, but this study really shows that in compar comparison to brentuximab with dotin, we actually can say that this is true. Now, uh, interestingly, it converts in some of these patients, as you saw in one of the slides, they can go back, uh, ended up receiving subsequent uh, transplant, meaning that as an eligibility, these patients were not supposed to be transplant eligible, but as a result of these treatments, they ended up being eligible. And we are learning more and more that in patients who achieve a complete remission with a checkpoint inhibitor, um, they can do well after auto transplant, which is uh, not consistent with what we think about being chemosensitive going to auto transplant. But we do have now multi center data showing that if you achieve a CR even with a checkpoint inhibitor, uh, post auto outcomes are, are reasonable. Uh, of course, uh, pre allo we have to be careful with use of checkpoint inhibitors with the risk of GVHD, but there are strategies to, to minimize that risk. So these are the conclusions, and I think uh, covers the first study. I believe we have time for questions at the end. So I'll move to the next study, which is a randomized trial. This is the ASPEN trial, uh, a phase three randomized trial, Zanabrutinib versus Ibrutinib for patients with Waldenstrom. Uh, so, uh, presented by Dr. Tam and, and uh, colleagues, and just a quick introduction. Uh, of course, ibrutinib is the first-in-class and first-generation BTK inhibitor, great drug, many indications for many lymphoid malignancies, and of course, uh, unrelated to this drug for chronic GVHD, but uh, ibrutinib has off-target effects, which can lead to unwanted side effects, so the idea is to come up with second generation BTK inhibitors that are as effective, hopefully, but also um, uh, better tolerated. So we have acalabrutinib already approved for CLL and mental cell lymphoma, uh, which is a second generation BTKI. Zanobrutinib is another uh, second generation BTKI, which is in uh, development. It's already approved for mental cell lymphoma and studies, registration studies are ongoing for other histologies. And this study looked specifically at uh, Waldenstrom population. So, the very, uh, in terms of potency and uh, uh, BTK occupation in peripheral blood and lymph nodes, it's, uh, it has uh, very promising preclinical data. Uh, it's a much cleaner BTK inhibitor compared to uh, ibrutinib uh, with uh, uh, higher selectivity for um, the BTK versus some of the other off target enzymes that you see there. Now, this, uh, and again, if you look at the, the IC50, which is the, the, the dose that you need to block a biological component by 50%, you see that the effect on BTK is great, but for other enzymes, you really um, have a much uh, less activity against those enzymes when, when we compare this drug to, to ibrutinib. So what about the study? The study was uh, on Waldenstrom uh, in patients with NYD88 mutation, as we know, NYD8 mutation is very common. It's not 100% incidence. It's around okay, different studies somewhere around uh, 80 to 90, uh, 85 to 90 percent or so. So, but the primary uh, uh, cohort for this study were, were Waldenstrom from uh, with NYD8 mutation. 200 of those patients were randomized to either uh, monotherapy with zanobrutinib. The dose was 100 milligram PO BIB versus ibrutinib, which is 420. Daily. I should mention that in terms of the eligibility, they could be either treatment naive or previously treated. But if they were treatment naive, they had to be uh, patients could not be uh, suitable for standard chemotherapy. And of okay. course, prior exposure to PTK inhibitors were not permitted on this study. There was a secondary cohort, which was on unmutated patients or wall, wall type by the ADA, but the primary um, uh, basically. Uh, well, I see a hand, a question, but I guess we'll go to the questions at the end. Uh, anyway, so the randomization we, we kind of covered, and the primary endpoint here was uh, efficacy. So they looked at the combination of complete response and very good partial response. As a reminder, it means that the IgM is for VGPR, IgM is detectable, but there is more than 90% decrease. So that was the primary endpoint. And with secondary endpoints, uh, there was a uh, further comparison of other. Uh, efficacy endpoints, but of course, more importantly, looking at the safety and tolerability of uh, zanobrutinib versus ibrutinib. <clears throat> uh, this is the disposition, uh, 200 patients, uh, uh, 99 on ibrutinib, one or two, uh, 
I think that in terms of patients who were treated and patients who came off study, this is uh, well balanced uh, here, as you see. Uh, not much to talk about in terms of the baseline characteristics. I don't want to spend much time. As you see here, 90% of uh, patients were uh, NYD88 mutated and CXCR4 wall type, which is expected. And uh, we also had uh, eight or somewhere between 8 to 11 percent of patients who had uh, both double mutation. So this is the primary efficacy endpoint. Uh, if you look at the combination of, uh, which is basically the VGPRs because there is no CRs here, uh, we have 19.2 percent with ibrutinib and 28.4 percent with xanabrutinib. Uh, the difference was not uh, statistically significant, as you see there, uh, with a p-value of uh, 0.09, so that the study did not reach the primary endpoint of efficacy in favor of xanobrutinib. So this was a, a huge effort to kind of go beat ibrutinib on a head-to-head -head study, uh, and, you know, despite the, the differences that you see there and the, the, the statistical analysis did not show the, the significance there. Uh, now, there's a secondary efficacy endpoint, which is uh, looking at the investigator assessed and uh, including the IgMA uh, area under curve. And there you do see a p-value that's significant. Again, the numbers are 28.4 versus 17. Uh, and then, uh, but really, in terms of the primary endpoint of the study, it was not reached. Uh, uh, but visually, looking at the responses, you can tell that there's a trend towards a better efficacy if it's unapproved. Uh, same thing, and the, basically the subgroups, uh, the the right side is, would be in favor of xanobrutinib, and you see that there is a there is a trend in the, all, all the subtypes in, in favor of xanobrutinib. Uh, here we have the PFS and overall survival curves. Uh, uh, they did not provide a p-value. I mean, again, visually we can tell the red curve, which is xanobrutinib, looks looks better. I don't. I don't know if this is significant in terms of the statistical analysis. I don't believe so. So I think the, maybe a more important message from this study, I mean, when, with acalabrutinib and ibrutinib, and by the way, the head-to-head -head study of acalabrutinib versus ibrutinib is not, uh, in, in CLL is not yet uh, presented. There is ongoing study with xanobrutinib versus ibrutinib. Uh, really, the field is really interested in, of course, the efficacy, but uh, if we have a hypothesis, the hypothesis would be this drug would be at least better tolerated, if not uh, better in terms of efficacy. So if you look at the, the side effect profile, and to, to guide you through this, when you see those red uh, uh, signs there, those, that those are significant uh, in terms of the p-value being less than 0 0.5. So I can tell you that uh, if you look at ibrutinib versus zonabrutinib, there is a higher rate of muscle cramp or spasm with ibrutinib compared to zonabrutinib, which is significant. Edema is more common with ibrutinib that's significant. Risk of or rate of AFib was higher with ibrutinib. And here you have the 14 versus 2%. Uh, then neutropenia, though, and, and let's talk about pneumonia. Pneumonia was com more common with, with ibrutinib. The only side effect that was more common with xanobrutinib was neutropenia. And with all grades, you have 25 versus 12%. Even looking at grade three or more, uh, you have 16 versus 8% in terms of the um, risk of or rate of neutropenia. So the take on point really is to remember that most of the side effects, all side effects were less common with xanobrutinib except for neutropenia. Uh, this is focusing on BTKI, uh, AEs of interest. Uh, so again, you have the AFib, you have the diarrhea, and you have the hemorrhage, and for all of them, uh, this is in favor of uh, vanabrutinib being a safer drug. Again, for neutropenia, though, in the, the, the bottom part, you see that it's, it's more common to see both uh, all grades and high grade neutropenias with vanabrutinib. Uh, I think this is just a longer follow-up in the interest of time. I think the conclusion is that the primary endpoint of this study, which is uh, which was the combination of CR and variable partial response, uh, was uh, the, the the primary endpoint was not seen. It was not significantly in favor of zanobrutinib, despite the trend and despite the, the numbers. But that, um, unfortunately, or uh, for for the study and you know for patients, the uh, 
they couldn't see a significant response in terms of efficacy, but uh, a better safety profile for the first time comparing a head-to-head -head study that is resolved that's with, between a BT first generation and a second generation PTKI showed that uh, except for neutropenia, all the other side effects were uh, better than for xanobritin compared to ibritin. I think I have uh, uh, ten, 10 more minutes, I hope. Uh, so. Uh, Last but not least, uh, this is the ZUMA-5 study. This is a CAR-T trial on follicular lymphoma patients and marginal zones. So uh, presented by Dr. Jacobson uh, at the meeting. And as a background, as you know, indolent non-Hodgkin lymphomas, mainly here the focus is follicular lymphoma and marginal zone, are considered incurable. Uh, and they, the, the natural history of disease is to have multiple relapses and uh, especially in patients who relapse within the first two years of uh, treatment, the outcomes are extremely poor. We have we've known that for for follicular lymphoma for a while. It's looking at different induction chemos, and uh, more recently, there's data on marginal zone that if you have a relapse within the first two years, we're looking at a very poor overall survival. As you see, one of the studies, for example, 50% overall survival in five years, which is extremely low for an indolent lymphoma. Uh, AXI cell is approved for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, as we all know, after, uh, in patients who had two prior lines of therapy. And uh, the ZUMA one study was the study that led to the approval, and we have long term responses now uh, in the range of 20 to 35 ish percent. So the, the ZUMA 5 study was trying to use the same CAR T, which is a CD19 targeted and uh, uh, CD28 uh, co stimulatory molecule. CAR T for, for follicular lymphoma and marginal zone lymphoma. Uh, really, the eligibility was nothing special other than patients with relapse refractory follicular lymphoma or marginal zone. They had to have two prior lines of therapy, which included a CD20 antibody and an alkylating agent. The lymphodepletion was a standard fludarabine cyclophosphamide for three days, and the dose was also the same dose we used for, for, for large cell lymphoma. The primary endpoint was overall response. Uh, I think it's important in any CAR T study to know what happened to the patients, and I, I should mention that the the, the time zero here is start of the LUCA or, or leukophoresis or T cell collection, and on the right, left side you see eight patients who uh, were not treated. Uh, the the four patients at the time of the, the data cut uh, were basically uh, between leukophoresis and uh, lymphodepletion, so they were waiting to be treated and the and the next follow up. So for, Hopefully, we'll have the results. However, there were four patients who didn't make it. One patient died because of, uh, I believe, disease-related causes, and the other three were not eligible, including one who had a biopsy and was found to have large cell lymphoma per investigators. And other patients were treated, which is, I think, it's a, uh, it's, it's good to know about this study. It's a great thing. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on baseline. Just know that 50% uh, uh, approximately 50% of patients had POD24, that's progression of disease within 24 months after first treatment. Those are the group that, as I mentioned, are extremely high risk. And around one quarter of patients had prior auto transplant. Please pay, pay attention to the smaller number of marginal zone patients. Uh, this is the primary endpoint, which is overall response. Uh, on the left panel, you see all patients. There was a high overall response of uh, rate of 93%, which is outstanding, including 80% complete response. Uh, that's all commerce. In follicular lymphoma, the 80%, I'm sorry, 80 patients, the overall response rate was 95%, again, with a CR rate of 81%. And in marginal zone, uh, the numbers are lower, uh, again, for investigators. Part of the reason is that some of these patients did not have measurable disease at baseline, so uh, being marginal zone, and they included both nodal and uh, uh, extra nodal. Uh, now, again, same trend uh, uh, in different uh, subgroups, uh, and, and I don't know, I'm not moving the slides, but uh, maybe because I'm late. The search is moving, but uh, duration of response in the blue curve would be follicular lymphoma, and green is marginal zone. And uh, you see that if you look at the 12 months, we are at 80% with follicular lymphoma. There were some late deaths on the study unrelated to CAR T and unrelated to follicular lymphoma per investigator. So it's a very promising looking curve, actually, if you go 
at one year, even beyond that, again, unfortunate deaths and, uh, for patients and for the study that are not related to disease or treatment. And the, the curve doesn't look as good for marginal zone lymphoma as you see here with the with, uh, number of uh, relapses there. The overall response looks good for both groups. You see those uh, green, uh, uh, the green curve or marginal zone patients who relapse are all alive. And you do have, uh, um, uh, yeah, but not for full Can we go back? Uh, and uh, I think we covered this. Uh, really, not, uh, the treatment side effects, I want to focus on cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity. Sorry? Okay. okay, so looking at cytokine release syndrome, uh, grade three, uh, so the CRS was uh, at any grade was around 70%. If you look at the grade three or more CRS for follicular lymphoma, it's 7%. So uh, this compared to uh, Zuma one for large cell lymphoma is a relatively lower number. Uh, you, you pay attention to the fact that uh, there were uh, uh, basically patients who 30% uh, 30 percent of patients had no CRS on the follicular arm. Uh, the neurotoxicity, 15% grade three or more, that's again much lower than what we saw with large cell lymphoma, which was around 30%. Again, pay attention that uh, almost half of the patients had no neurotoxicity with this treatment. So the last slide, uh, very high response rates and harsh high CR rates with, with uh, axi cell and follicular lymphoma. The safety profile was manageable and consistent with the axis cell study uh, for the large cell lymphoma. I should, uh, as you know, that for this specific CAR, this is given inpatient. And uh, the, the investigators at least suggested on this slide, and this is their slide, that given the acceptable rate of uh, toxicities and the fact that the median time to CRS here, for example, was four days versus two days in large cell lymphoma, they're suggesting that maybe there's a potential for outpatient therapy with, with this one, but again, we only to wait and see that the final analysis, this was an interim analysis, but ex extremely promising data, and there are many CAR-T studies going on for, for follicular lymphoma, and we'll hopefully have something for, for indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma as approved at, in the near future. Uh, I think that's it for me, and I appreciate your uh, time.